glad to see you here today. This is uh, the final week of Epiphany. Believe it or not, we finally have come to the end. So as I've said, uh, Epiphany can fluctuate year to year just depending on when Easter falls. Sometimes it's short, sometimes it's long, and this year it was long. So this is week number nine, but we're going to be wrapping this thing up today. And then, of course, next Sunday we'll be kicking off our uh, kind of official Lent series. Although the season of Lent starts this Wednesday, Ash Wednesday uh, is when uh, Lent kicks off but we'll be uh, starting to kind of dig into Lent topics next Sunday. Uh, During Epiphany, of course, looking at the life, ministry, teachings of Jesus, uh, next week we'll kind of turn our attention towards his death and suffering as we prepare our hearts for Easter. Uh, But what we've been looking at just kind of uh, as a whole from uh, Advent all the way through Easter, what we're looking at is kind of exploring the subject of the kingdom of God and what Jesus came to reveal and say about the kingdom, especially in his life teachings uh, and and miracles over the past few weeks. So last week we specifically looked at what is known as Peter's confession. And we saw this interesting story where Jesus and his disciples uh, arrive in the region of Caesarea of Philippi and Jesus asks them what do people say about me right what what's kind of the word on the street what what is my rep and and they begin to give some kind of interesting answers that ranging everywhere from John the Baptist reincarnated to uh, Elijah or one of the other prophets And, and so they have all these different answers of who Jesus is and then Jesus turns the question on them and says who do you say that I am Right? And what I said last week is that every single one of us have to answer that question. Right? And Jesus always makes the, 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 the differentiation between what people say about him and what you say about him. Because at the end of the day, what's most important is who you say God is. Right? What, I, what I said last week is that what, what you think about when you think about God is the most important thing about you. That's what A.W. Tozer said. Right? And I agree with it, right? What, what you think about when you think about God, your answer to the question, who do you say that I am, is the most important thing about you because it's going to shape and define everything else about your life. So the example I gave was if you see God as a sort of evil tyrant, then not only are you going to relate to God that way, but you're going to relate to others that way. Right? You're, you're going to relate to others with judgment and condemnation. However, if you see God as a loving, merciful, gracious Father, not only are you going to relate to God in that way, but you're going to relate to others with love and grace and mercy. Right? And so what we think about when we think about God is the most important thing about us. And so Jesus asks his disciples, who do you say that I am? Not what others say, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answers, you are the Christ the son of the living God, right? You are Lord and King of heaven and earth. And then Jesus, of course, responds that that you are Peter, you are Petrus, you are a rock. And on this Petra, on this larger rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So what I said last week, and and this is going to kind of play into today. Today's kind of really a continuation of last week. And so what I said last week is that our mission as the church is to storm the gates of hell. And and the good news that we have is that we have guaranteed victory. Jesus guarantees that the gates of hell will not prevail against us. And so our mission as the church is to storm the gates of hell, push back the kingdom of darkness. And Jesus guarantees that the gates of hell will not prevail against us. We have guaranteed victory in and through him. So that's what we looked at last week. Today, uh, we're going to kind of really, like I said, continue uh, that, that kind of theme into today. And we're going to wrap up the season of Epiphany with uh, an interesting story in Luke chapter 10. Uh, so if you have your Bibles and want to turn there, we'll have it on the screen, of course. Uh, but this is Luke uh, chapter 10. Uh, this is an interesting story. We see Jesus kind of sends out his disciples on a sort of training mission here. So Luke chapter 10, I'm going to start in verse 1. We're going to read through verse 12. This is what it says. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them on ahead of him, two by two, into every town and place where he himself was about to go. And he said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go your way. Behold, I am sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. Carry no money bag, no knapsack, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say, peace be to this house. 
And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest upon him. But if not, it will return to you. And remain in the same house, eating and drinking what they provide, for the laborer deserves his wages. Do not go from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and they receive you, eat what is set before you. Heal the sick in it and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. But whenever you enter a town and they do not receive you, go into its streets and say, even the dust of your town that clings to our feet will be wiped off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near. I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. All right, so out of this text, and it's kind of an interesting text, there's a lot happening here, but out of this text, I want to talk about four different things. So here's kind of my outline. For those of you who are taking notes, you A-B type people, I've got a nice little outline here for you. So I'm going to give that to you. So, so, and you're, you're going to like it because I've got alliteration too. They all start with M. So, so we're going to talk about our mission. We're going to talk about our message. We're going to talk about our method. And then we're going to talk about our motivation. So a nice, good four-point sermon with all with the letter M. It's, it's awesome. So, uh, so we're going to look at each one of these in turn. So first, let's talk about our mission. And so in this story, we see that Jesus sends out 72 people on, on kind of a, a training mission. And, and actually a little bit earlier in Luke, like a chapter or two earlier, he actually sends out his 12 disciples on a very similar mission. In fact, he gives them almost identical instructions. And so here we see that Jesus is sending out 72 others. It's just interesting to point out that, that Jesus, we often think of Jesus, Jesus and his 12 disciples, but he, he had some estimate possibly hundreds of disciples. He had his 12 kind of inner core group that lived with him and, and just traveled with him and spent all their time with Jesus. But then he had many others that he was also discipling and teaching. And so here we see Jesus sends out a group of 72 people on sort of a kind of a training exercise. And he sends them out. He says, I want you to go out into different towns kind of ahead of me, right? I'll arrive after you but I want you to kind of go lay the groundwork and then you're going to come back and report to me kind of what happened and what what you learned and so we see that they are sent into towns to kind of prepare the way for Jesus so so of course the question is what is our mission as disciples of Jesus as kingdom citizens right what is our mission well our mission is simply to prepare the way for King Jesus This is what Jesus sent his disciples to do. I want you to go out into the different towns and basically prepare the way for me. Our mission is to prepare the way for King Jesus. There's two things I want us to remember about this mission. And again, some of this, we we talked about this last week, so I'm just really reiterating. So number one, I want us to remember that we are walking in the authority and victory of our King. And so what I said last week, what Jesus tells his disciples, he he says that that we are to storm the gates of hell and the gates of hell will not prevail against us. And then he says that that we've been given the keys to the kingdom and whatever we bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever we loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So what I said, what this means, we kind of get this a little bit confused and we think that this means that we've been given ultimate authority and God kind of obeys our will and our commands. But it's actually the opposite. Right, what it means to be given keys to the kingdom is, is we've been trusted as stewards of his keys. Right? We, we are stewards, we are ambassadors of his kingdom and he's given us his authority that whatever he, he has willed in heaven we can exercise here on this earth. Right? We, we are walking in the authority and victory of our king and this is why Jesus says the gates of hell will not prevail against us. We have guaranteed victory because we're walking in his authority, not our own, right? It's important for us to remember when it comes to our mission, whose authority and victory we're walking in. We're walking in the authority and victory of our king. We are simply ambassadors representing his kingdom in the earth, right? So we're walking in the authority and victory of Jesus. And the second thing I want us to remember about this mission is that we are preparing the way for Jesus by pushing back the kingdom of darkness, Right, that this is ultimately our mission, right? It's to storm the gates of hell, to push back the kingdom of darkness as we advance the kingdom of light, preparing the way for King Jesus. Now, now we see here in, in the text, we, we see that this need is great, right? When it comes to our mission of pushing back the darkness, storming the gates of hell, preparing the way for King Jesus, we see that, that the need is great. There is not a lack of need. There's actually a lack of laborers. Again, this is what Jesus said in Luke chapter 10, verse 2. 
Jesus said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Right, when it comes to our mission to push back the darkness, to storm the gates of hell, that there's plenty of need. Jesus said what's lacking is laborers. Right, what's lacking is people who are willing to answer the call and, and to pick up the mantle, to carry out the mission. Right? There, there's plenty of territory to claim for Jesus. Right? There's plenty of land to claim that the issue is not the need, the issue is the workers. Right? There's pl- Jesus said there's plenty, uh, the harvest is plentiful, the, the laborers are few. And, and so what I, what I said last week and what I say all the time is to, to, to get off the sidelines and to participate in what Jesus is inviting us to participate in. And, and so what I said last week is that so many of us get bored, and not only in our Christianity, but we just get bored in life because we're sitting on the sidelines just kind of watching and this is why we, we, like we have this desire in us for greatness. We have this desire in us for adventure, to do something. And this is why we give ourselves over to entertainment. So why we watch movies and we read books because we, we, we want to be a part of something greater than what, than what we're a part of. And all the while, God is inviting us to participate in the greatest story ever told. He's inviting us to get in the game and to participate in his work of pushing back the kingdom of darkness. But so many of us, we get bored in our Christianity. We get bored in our life because we're not participating in what Jesus is inviting us to participate in, this kingdom mission of pushing back the darkness. And and Jesus says, look, the, the harvest is plentiful. The laborers are few. And so if you're sitting on the sideline just kind of spectating and maybe using the excuse of like, well, there's not really anything for me to do. I don't know, like God doesn't really need me. What can I contribute for his kingdom like Jesus is calling you out here and saying, look, there's plenty of harvest. There's plenty to do. The laborers are few. Too many of us are sitting on the sidelines just kind of watching. And how boring is that? Right? All the while Jesus is invited, hey, get in the game, participate, get in the fight. And so I'm going to keep saying it over and over and over again. To, 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 if you're bored in your Christianity, it's probably because you're sitting on the sidelines just kind of watching. And it's become this spectator sport for you, which is boring, right? It's not meant to be spectated. It's meant to be participated. And Jesus is inviting us, hey, push back darkness, right? Don't just come to church and listen to sermons. Push back the darkness wherever you are, right? In your home, in your community, wherever you work, right? Wherever you are, we are called to push back the kingdom of darkness because the harvest is plentiful, the laborers are few. Jesus said, pray that, that laborers will rise up and go forth. Right? There's plenty of work to be done. And so what we see here that, that there's, uh, our mission is to push back the kingdom of darkness. But then second, I want us to talk about our message. So, so our mission is to push back the darkness. But what is our message? We see Jesus says in Luke chapter 10 verse 9 that we are to heal the sick and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. So what, what is our message? As we go about our mission of pushing back the darkness, what, what is our message? Well, Jesus says it simply that, that our message is the kingdom of God is here. Right? The king has arrived. This is our message, is to herald, as we push back the kingdom of darkness, we are heralding the king's arrival. Right? This is what they, they, Jesus sent them out to do. Go out into these different towns and villages and, and ahead of me and kind of prepare the way and let them know, hey, the kingdom of God is here. Right? The king has arrived. And this is simply our, mes- our message as the people of God. Right, as we push back the darkness and advance the kingdom of God, we're declaring, kind of heralding the message of the king's arrival. And this is a message of incredible hope and good news. Right, this message of the king's arrival is not a message of judgment. It's not a message of condemnation. It's a message of incredible hope and good news. And the reason is, and what I've been saying for weeks now, is that what the kingdom of God does is it, it brings light to the darkness, it brings order to the chaos, and beauty to the formlessness. 
right? I, I mentioned this last week. We, we looked, we've looked at this a couple of times already kind of in this exploration of what, what you see in the Garden of Eden, right? In Genesis chapter one, you see God is establishing his kingdom. He's establishing his dominion and authority in the earth. And what is, what is happening in the first couple of verses of Genesis in the entire Bible, God is bringing light into the darkness. You see him bringing order into the chaos and beauty into the formlessness. And this is what God's kingdom does. Right, wherever God's kingdom is, wherever his dominion and authority is, you see light breaking into the darkness, order into the chaos, beauty into the formlessness. So this is why our message of, of the king's arrival is such good news, is because wherever he is, light is coming into the darkness, order to the chaos, beauty to the formlessness. This is what God's kingdom does. And so this is why we herald the message of this good news, of this kingdom. Because again, it's not a message of judgment and condemnation. It's a message, it's a message of good news. That the king has arrived, his kingdom is here, and he's pushing back the darkness. He's bringing order to the chaos, beauty to the formlessness. And so this is why Jesus often says that when we are to preach the kingdom of God, we, we are to preface it with repentance, Right? Jesus often says, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Right? We have to repent. But, but again, repentance is not a, a message of condemnation and judgment. Repentance is actually an invitation into reconciliation and restoration. Repentance is this turn away from the darkness, turn away from the chaos, and enter into God's kingdom. Again, it's this invitation into hope and good news. And this is the message that we herald to the earth. It's this message of, hey, the king has arrived. The kingdom of God is here. He's pushing back the darkness. He's bringing hope. He's bringing life, and he's bringing peace. And this is our message. So, so our mission is to push back the kingdom of darkness. Our message is to herald the arrival of this kingdom and our king. And then uh, thirdly, I want us to talk about our method. Because here in Luke chapter 10, Jesus gives some very specific and strange instructions on kind of how to carry out this mission. Again, he sends 72 people on this, on this sort of training exercise. I want you to go out. I want you to push back the darkness. I want you to herald my arrival. And, and then he gives them some interesting instructions on how they're to carry this out. So I want to look at these just in turn real quick. There's five that I want to talk about. So the first one we see is teamwork. And we see in verse one that they were sent out in pairs of two, right? And it's really interesting because I was thinking about this. There were 72 of them and Jesus could have sent them all out individually and covered a lot more ground, right? I mean, he could have sent them out into 72 different villages and towns and cities, but instead he sent them out two by two, right? In pairs, why does Jesus do this? Well, I think there's a lot of reasons for it, but I think primarily Jesus is trying to emphasize the, the importance of teamwork and community in the body of Christ. Right? That there are no lone rangers when it comes to his kingdom work. Right? You can't lone ranger it. That's not a thing. Right? And, and you see here that, that Jesus sends them out two by two. Right? He, again, he could have covered a lot more ground but it would have been a lot less effective. And Jesus knew that the strategy of, of how important teamwork is, and he sends them out two by two, that, that there is no such thing as lone rangering it in the kingdom of God, right? That, that you, you can't do that. And if you try to do that, you're gonna be a lot less effective. And so the first method that we see, how do we carry out this mission as the body of Christ? We are to do it together, right? There's teamwork, there's power in uh, community. And so, so we, we need teamwork first and foremost and then number two the second thing we see is is we need courage in verse three he tells them he says I'm sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves I mean he straight up tells them like hey look this is gonna be really really difficult right I'm basically you're like I'm leading you to your slaughter right like lambs in the midst of wolves and so I think this is uh, again part of why he sends them out in groups of two because he knows hey this is going to be incredibly difficult um, it's like I'm sending you out in the midst of wolves right and, and so what is Jesus saying you, you need courage right the mission is dangerous but fear not right l l later on Jesus says that, that he, to fear not for he has overcome the world Right? Again, we, we don't fear because we, we, we have a th 
authority and victory in Jesus, right? We can stand with courage because of the authority and victory he's given us, right? And so we need courage. We need backbone. If we're going to carry out this mission of pushing back the darkness, like it's not going to be easy. Like we're guaranteed victory, but it's not going to be easy. And so if we're going to fulfill this mission, we need courage. We need to know it's not going to be easy, but but fear not, for he has overcome the world. And so we need teamwork, we need courage, and then thirdly, we see that we need trust. It's really interesting because in verse 4, he tells them to carry no money or possessions. He says, I'm sending you out, right, and I don't want you to take any money with you. I don't want you to take any food, no possessions, right? Just go and just trust that I'm going to provide for you. Right? And so he sends them out with nothing. And I think what Jesus was trying to kind of teach them is just the importance of trust. That as citizens and ambassadors of his kingdom, we are to trust that our king is going to provide all that we need. So if we're going to fulfill this mission in the earth, we, we need not only teamwork and courage, but we need trust. Trusting that our king is going to provide all that we need. And then fourthly, we see, it's really interesting, and, and it kind of... Uh, it's really uh, the, the other side of the same coin of trust, kind of hand in hand. We see that we need gratitude. In verse 5 through 8, he tells them, he basically says, bless those who receive you and eat whatever they offer you. Right? And so there's kind of this sense of like, I mean, he basically tells them like, hey, whatever they feed you, take it. Don't go house to house looking for better options. Right? Just whenever you enter in a town, just whoever will welcome you in, Go into their house, eat whatever food they offer you, and, and receive it with gratitude and gladness. And again, I mean, this is, it kind of goes hand in hand with trust. This sense of like, trust that I'm going to provide for you, and whatever I provide for you, receive with gratitude. Right? Years ago, one of my nieces, she's now like 13 or 14 or something. It's crazy. I, I lose track. But when she was a, a lot younger, one time I was complaining about something. I don't remember what it was. But she, told, she looks at me and says, you get what you get and you don't throw a fit. Right? And I mean, just incredibly wise and profound. And I was like, well, I mean, I can't argue with that. And it's true. Right? I mean, but this is how it is in the kingdom of God, right? You get what you get and you don't throw a fit, right? And this is why we need trust and gratitude because whatever God provides for us, we receive with gladness. We we don't look for better options. We, we, We just receive what God gives us with gratitude and gladness. And then number five, the fifth kind of method we see here, Jesus says that we need confidence, In verse 10 through 12, he talks about, he says that that when you go into a town and you are basically rejected, to shake the dust off your feet and move on and give them a stern warning of judgment. Basically, if a town rejects you, just say, hey, look, don't take it personally. Have confidence, have courage and backbone. Don't take it personally. Just shake the dust off, move on, and just let them know, hey, the kingdom, whether you like it or not, the kingdom of God's here and you're making a mistake by rejecting it. Right? But, but in order to, to order to do that, like Jesus is saying, we need confidence. We need, we need confidence in the mission that he's assigned us. Again, when, when people reject God, they're not rejecting us. Like we don't take it personally. But we, we just stand confidently just in the mission he's given us and with boldness, courage, and confidence. And so this is the method in which God tells us we are to carry out this mission. So we've talked about our mission, we've talked about our message and our method, but fourthly, I want us to talk about our motivation. What what should be our motivation behind all of this? Well, back in Luke chapter 10, uh, we didn't read it, but I want us to look at it a little bit later. So he sends out the 72 people on this training exercise, and then he, when they return, he, he wants a report, like what happens? Right? And so this is what we see. It's really interesting. In Luke chapter 10, starting in verse 17, it says this. The 72 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. And behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. So it's really interesting. So Jesus sends out the 72, and once they return, they give this exciting report. Like, hey, Jesus, it was awesome. Like, we were able to cast out demons. 
Like we've seen you cast out demons, but even we were able to do it. It was amazing, right? But Jesus' response is interesting because he, he doesn't say, good job, guys, that's awesome. Like what, what Jesus says is interesting. He says to them, he, he gives, he, basically he says two things. Number one, he says, well, obviously, like duh, like you shouldn't be surprised that you were able to cast out demons because I gave you the authority, I mean, this is what Jesus has been trying to tell him, right? This is what we looked at last week, right? I gave you the keys to the kingdom, right? You have authority in my name. Like, so you shouldn't be surprised. I mean, that's pretty obvious, right? You, you have authority in my name to do this kingdom work, to push back the darkness. But then secondly, even more surprising, he says to them, basically, don't, don't rejoice in this. Like, don't rejoice in your authority. Rejoice in your identity, and don't rejoice that demons are subject to your name. Don't, don't rejoice in the authority I've given you. Rejoice in your identity as sons and daughters of the king. Right, now, now, I want to look at another verse in Matthew chapter 7. Because this is a terrifying verse, but, but I think it's going to be good for us. So Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 through 23. This is what Jesus says. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. This is shocking and terrifying because what Jesus is saying is on that day, there's gonna be people who A, call him Lord, call him King, and B, do all this incredible kingdom work in his name. Notice that they weren't doing this stuff in their own name. Like they, they, were, they were exercising this authority that they had been given in the name of Jesus, calling him Lord, and yet Jesus will say to them, I don't even know who you are. I don't know your name. This is a terrifying reality for us that, that we, can, we can do kingdom work, incredible kingdom work, all in his name and all the while not even be a true citizen of his kingdom. And he doesn't even know who we are. And so this is why Jesus, when the disciples come back to him and they're excited, right? We, we were able to cast out demons in your name. It was amazing. Jesus says to them, look, that's great and all. I mean, it's obvious. I gave you authority. That's awesome. But don't rejoice in that. Like that, that's, not where your, uh, that's not where your joy should be. Your joy should be that your names are written in heaven and your identity as sons and daughters. Right? That's what you should be rejoicing in. And, and so the terrifying reality for us is that we can spend our lives doing incredible kingdom work all in his name and all the while not even be known by him. So our joy and our security should never be in our kingdom work. Our joy and security should always be in our identities as kingdom citizens. Right? This is what Jesus is saying. And so what motivates our mission? What, what is it that motivates us? What is it that should drive us? Our motivation should always be our relationship with the king. Again, our, our motivation isn't our our authority that we've been given our motivation should be our identity as sons and daughters of the king and, and when we realize that then we know that we can we can remember where our authority even comes from in the first place because what i've been saying is that the authority that we exercise is not our own authority it's the authority of the king and we are simply his ambassadors walking in his authority and so at the end of the day we, we can't even rejoice in that Right? So when we do incredible kingdom stuff in his name, we can't even rejoice in that. We can't, even, we can't take credit for it because it, it all came from him in the first place. Right? We're exercising his authority. We're simply his ambassadors, his sons and daughters. Right? That's where our joy comes from, our identity in him, not from our authority. Right? Another way of saying it is that, is that we don't fight for victory. We fight from victory. And, and as I kind of wrap this up, I, I want to make that distinction very clear because I've seen this play out in my own life and I've seen it play out in many other people, this, uh, this sense of we're, we're fighting for victory, 
right? And we work so hard to fight for victory. We're just trying to win. And we want to make God proud. And we want to make ourselves proud. And we want to make other people proud. It's like we're fighting for victory. But the reality is we don't fight for victory. We fight from victory. And the difference is that we're not trying to win the battle. We know the victory's already won. Right? The battle is his and the victory is guaranteed. Right? I mean, Jesus said, the gates of hell will not prevail against you. Right? We don't, so we don't have to fight for victory. We're fighting from a place of victory. Right? And that should free us up to know that, that our identity is securely in him. The victory's already been won. We're simply walking in the authority he's given us. And this is our ultimate motivation. Our motivation isn't to to get the victory. Our motivation is we've already been given the victory because we're children of the Most High God. We're ambassadors and we're walking in the authority that he has. And our joy and our security is not in that. It's in our identity in him. This is our motivation. And so my prayer for us is as we hopefully become kingdom people that are pushing back the darkness, that aren't on the sidelines but are participating in the game, pushing back the darkness, heralding this message of the kingdom of God, my prayer is that our motivation is always not in the kingdom work itself, but our motivation is in our identity as sons and daughters of the Most High God. That our motivation is always not not that we have to win, But our motivation is that Jesus has already guaranteed the victory. Jesus has already guaranteed the victory and we're simply walking in that as his children, as his ambassadors in the earth. May our identity always be in him, not in what we do. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you that you have guaranteed the victory on our behalf. We don't have to win. We don't have to do anything. The, The battle's already been won and you've given us authority to walk in it. We don't fight for victory, we fight from victory. This is why you've saved us, God. This is why you've rescued and redeemed us, that we can get in the game, that we can fight the battle, that we can push back the darkness in the earth. I pray that we would be your ambassadors walking in that authority. But I pray this morning that, that our, that our uh, security and our joy wouldn't be in that authority you've given us. It would be in our identity as your children that we would never lose sight of, of who we are in you. God, we, we want to have a right understanding of you. We, we want to we have right uh, knowledge of who you are, but we also want to know who, who you see we are, that you see us as your children, you see us as your, as your people. You've chosen and loved and accepted us, and we just want to rest in that this morning. We don't, we don't have to work for it. We, we could just rest. So I pray that we would be ever reminded of that reality. That, that would be our joy this morning. So we are your children. So we thank you for it, God. It's in your name we pray. Amen.